Upon Our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, Discourse 2 Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matters of heathenism for a branch of true Christianity. Nor does Christian meekness imply the being without zeal for God, any more than it does ignorance or insensibility. No, it keeps clear of every extreme, whether in excess or defect. It does not destroy but balance the affections, which the God of nature never designed should be rooted out by grace, but only brought and kept under due regulations. It poses the mind aright. It holds an even scale with regard to anger and sorrow and fear, preserving the mean in every circumstance of life and not declining either to the right hand or the left. Meekness, therefore, seems properly to relate to ourselves, but it may be referred either to God or our neighbor. When this due composure of mind has reference to God, it is usually termed resignation, a calm acquiescence in whatsoever is his will concerning us, even though it may not be pleasing to nature, saying continually, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. When we consider it more strictly with regard to ourselves, we style it patience or contentedness. When it is exerted toward other men, then it is mildness to the good and gentleness to the evil. They who are truly meek can clearly discern what is evil, and they can also suffer it. They are sensible of everything of this kind, but still meekness holds the reins. They are exceeding zealous for the Lord of hosts. But their zeal is always guided by knowledge and tempered in every thought and word and work with the love of man as well as the love of God. They do not desire to extinguish any of the passions which God has for wise ends implanted in their nature, but they have the mastery of all. They hold them all in subjection and employ them only in subservience to those ends. And thus even the harsher and more unpleasing passions are applicable to the noblest purposes. Even hatred and anger and fear, when engaged against sin and regulated by faith and love, are as walls and bulwarks to the soul, so that the wicked one cannot approach to hurt it. It is evident this divine temper is not only to abide but to increase in us day by day. Occasions of exercising, and thereby increasing it, will never be wanting while we remain upon earth. We have need of patience, that after we have done, and suffered, the will of God, we may receive the promise. We have need of resignation, that we may in all circumstances say, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. And we have need of gentleness toward all men, but especially toward the evil and unthankful. Otherwise we shall be overcome of evil instead of overcoming evil with good. Nor does meekness restrain only the outward act, as the scribes and Pharisees taught of old, without a cause, without a sufficient cause, or farther than that cause requires, shall be in danger of the judgment, anahas estai, shall in that moment be obnoxious to the righteous judgment of God. But would not one be inclined to prefer the reading of those copies which omit the word Eka, without a cause? Is it not entirely superfluous? For if anger at persons be a temper contrary to love, how can there be a cause, a sufficient cause for it, any that will justify it in the sight of God? Anger at sin we allow. In this sense we may be angry, and yet we sin not. In this sense our Lord himself is once recorded to have been angry. He looked round about upon them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He was grieved at the sinners and angry at the sin. And this is undoubtedly right before God. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, whosoever shall give way to anger so as to utter any contemptuous word. It is observed by commentators that Raka is a Syriac word, which properly signifies empty, vain, foolish so that it is as inoffensive an expression as can well be used toward one at whom we are displeased. 
and yet whosoever shall use this as our lord assures us shall be in danger of the council rather shall be obnoxious thereto he shall be liable to a severer sentence from the judge of all the earth but whosoever shall say thou fool whosoever shall so give place to the devil as to break out into revelling into designedly reproachful and contumelious language shall be obnoxious to hell fire shall in that instant be liable to the highest condemnation it should be observed that our lord describes all these as obnoxious to capital punishment the first to strangling usually inflicted on those who were condemned in one of the inferior courts the second to stoning which was frequently inflicted on those who were condemned by the great council at jerusalem the third to burning alive inflicted only on the highest offenders in the valley of the sons of Hanum, gehenna from which that word is evidently taken which we translate hell and whereas men naturally imagine that god will excuse their defect in some duties for their exactness in others our lord next takes care to cut off that vein through common imagination he shows that it is impossible for any sinner to commute with god who will not accept one duty for another nor take a part of obedience for the whole he warns us that the performing our duty to god will not excuse us from our duty to our neighbor that works of piety as they are called will be so far from commending us to god if we are wanting in charity that on the contrary that want of charity will make all those works an abomination to the lord therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee on account of thy unkind behavior toward him of thy calling him raka or thou fool think not that thy gift will atone for thy anger or that it will find any acceptance with god so long as thy conscience is defiled with the guilt of unrepented sin lead there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother at least to all that in thee lies towards being reconciled and then come and offer thy gift matthew five twenty three twenty four and let there be no delay in what so nearly concerneth thy soul agree with thine adversary quickly now upon the spot whilst thou art in the way with him if it be possible before he go out of thy sight lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge lest he appeal to god the judge of all and the judge deliver thee to the officer to satan the executioner of the wrath of god and thou be cast into prison into hell there to be reserved to the judgment of the great day verily i say unto thee thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing but this is impossible for thee ever to do seeing thou hast nothing to pay therefore if thou art once in that prison the smoke of thy torment must ascend up for ever and ever meantime the meek shall inherit the earth such is the foolishness of worldly wisdom the wise of the world had warned them again and again that if they did not resent such treatment if they would tamely suffer themselves to be thus abused there would be no living for them upon earth that they would never be able to procure the common necessaries of life nor to keep even what they had that they could expect no peace no quiet possession no enjoyment of anything most true suppose there were no god in the world or suppose he did not concern himself with the children of men but when god ariseth to judgment and to help all the meek upon the earth how doth he laugh all this heathen wisdom to scorn and turn the fierceness of man to his praise he takes a peculiar care to provide them with all things needful for life and godliness he secures to them the provision he hath made in spite of the force fraud or malice of men and what he secures he gives them richly to enjoy it is sweet to them be it little or much as in patience they possess their souls so they truly possess whatever god hath given them they are always content always pleased with what they have it pleases them because it pleases god 
so that while their heart, their desire, their joy is in heaven, they may truly be said to inherit the earth. But there seems to be a yet farther meaning in these words, even that they shall have a more eminent part in the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, in that inheritance, a general description of which, and the particulars we shall know hereafter, St. John has given in the twentieth chapter of Revelation. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, and bound him a thousand years. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and of them which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again, until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 26 Our Lord has hitherto been more immediately employed in removing the hindrances of true religion such is pride the first grand hindrance of all religion which is taken away by poverty of spirit levity and thoughtlessness which prevent any religion from taking root in the soul till they are removed by holy mourning such are anger impatience discontent which are all healed by christian meekness and when once these hindrances are removed these evil diseases of the soul which were continually raising false cravings therein and filling it with sickly appetites the native appetite of a heaven-born spirit returns it hungers and thirsts after righteousness and blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled righteousness as was observed before is the image of god the mind which was in christ jesus it is every holy and heavenly temper in one springing from as well as terminating in the love of god as our father and redeemer and the love of all men for his sake blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after this in order fully to understand which expression we should observe first that hunger and thirst are the strongest of all our bodily appetites in like manner this hunger in the soul this thirst after the image of god is the strongest of all our spiritual appetites when it is once awakened in the heart yea it swallows up all the rest in that one great desire to be renewed after the likeness of him that created us we should secondly observe that from the time we begin to hunger and thirst those appetites do not cease but are more and more craving and importunate till we either eat and drink or die and even so from the time that we begin to hunger and thirst after the whole mind which was in christ these spiritual appetites do not cease but cry after their food with more and more importunity nor can they possibly cease before they are satisfied while there is any spiritual life remaining we may thirdly observe that hunger and thirst are satisfied with nothing but meat and drink if you would give to him that is hungry all the world beside all the elegance of apparel all the trappings of state all the treasure upon earth nay thousands of gold and silver if you would pay him ever so much honor he regards it not all these things are then of no account with him he would still say these are not the things i want give me food or else i die the very same is the case with every soul that truly hungers and thirsts after righteousness he can find no comfort in anything but this he can be satisfied with nothing else whatever you offer besides it is lightly esteemed whether it be riches or honor or pleasure he still says this is not the thing which i want give me love or else i die and it is as impossible to satisfy such a soul a soul that is a thirst for god the living god with what the world accounts religion as with what they account happiness the religion of the world implies three things one the doing no harm the abstaining from outward sin at least from such as is scandalous as robbery theft common swearing drunkenness two the doing good the relieving the poor the being charitable as it is called three the using the means of grace at least the going to church and to the lord's supper 
He in whom these three marks are found is termed by the world a religious man. But will this satisfy him who hungers after God? No. It is not food for his soul. He wants a religion of a nobler kind, a religion higher and deeper than this. He can no more feed on this poor, shallow, formal thing than he can fill his belly with the east wind. True, he is careful to abstain from the very appearance of evil. He is zealous of good works. He attends all the ordinances of God. But all this is not what he longs for. This is only the outside of that religion which he insatiably hungers after, the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus, the life which is hid with Christ in God, the being joined unto the Lord in one spirit, the having fellowship with the Father and the Son, the walking in the light as God is in the light, the being purified even as he is pure. This is the religion, the righteousness he thirsts after, nor can he rest till he thus rests in God. Blessed are they who thus hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled with the things which they long for, even with righteousness and true holiness. God shall satisfy them with blessings of his goodness, with the felicity of his chosen. He shall feed them with the bread of heaven, with the manna of his love. He shall give them to drink of his pleasures as out of the river, which he that drinketh of shall never thirst, only for more and more of the water of life. This thirst shall endure for ever. The painful thirst, the fond desire, thy joy's presence shall remove, but my full soul shall still require a whole eternity of love. Whosoever then thou art to whom God hath given to hunger and thirst after righteousness, Cry unto him that thou mayest never lose that inestimable gift, that this divine appetite may never cease. If many rebuke thee and bid thee hold thy peace, regard them not. Yea, cry so much the more. Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Let me not live but to be holy as thou art holy. No more spend thy money for that which is not bread, nor thy labor for that which satisfieth not. Canst thou hope to dig happiness out of the earth? to find it in the things of the world o oh, trample under foot all its pleasures despise its honours count its riches as dung and dross yea and all the things which are beneath the sun for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus for the entire renewal of thy soul in that image of god wherein it was originally created beware of quenching that blessed hunger and thirst by what the world calls religion a religion of form of outward show which leaves the heart as earthly and sensual as ever let nothing satisfy thee but the power of godliness but a religion that is spirit and life thy dwelling in god and god in thee the being an inhabitant of eternity the entering in by the blood of sprinkling within the veil and sitting in heavenly places with christ jesus and the more they are filled with the life of god the more tenderly will they be concerned for those who are still without god in the world still dead in trespasses and sins nor shall this concern for others lose its reward blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy the word used by our lord more immediately implies the compassionate the tender-hearted those who far from despising earnestly grieve for those that do not hunger after god this eminent part of brotherly love is here by a common figure put for the whole so that the merciful in the full sense of the term are they who love their neighbors as themselves because of the vast importance of this love without which though we spake with the tongues of men and angels though we had the gift of prophecy and understood all mysteries and all knowledge though we had all faith so as to remove mountains yea though we gave all our goods to feed the poor and our very bodies to be burned it would profit us nothing the wisdom of god has given us by the apostle paul a full and particular account of it by considering which we shall most clearly discern who are the merciful that shall obtain mercy charity or love as it were to be wished it had been rendered throughout being a far plainer and less ambiguous word the love of our neighbour as christ hath loved us suffereth long is patient toward all men 
It suffers all the weakness, ignorance, errors, infirmities, all the forwardness and littleness of faith of the children of God, all the malice and wickedness of the children of the world. And it suffers all this, not only for a time, for a short season, but to the end, still feeding our enemy when he hungers, if he thirsts, still giving him drink, thus continually heaping coals of fire, of melting love, upon his head. And in every step toward this desirable end, the overcoming evil with good, love is kind, Crestuatai, a word not easily translated. It is soft, mild, benign. It stands at the utmost distance from moroseness, from all harshness or sourness of spirit, and inspires the sufferer at once with the most amiable sweetness and the most fervent and tender affection. Consequently, love envieth not. It is impossible it should. It is directly opposite to that baneful temper. It cannot be that he who has this tender affection to all, who earnestly wishes all temporal and spiritual blessings, all good things in this world and the world to come, to every soul that God hath made, should be pained at his bestowing any good gift on any child of man. If he has himself received the same, he does not grieve, but rejoice, that another partakes of the common benefit. If he has not, he blesses God that his brother at least has, and is herein happier than himself and the greater his love the more does he rejoice in the blessings of all mankind the farther is he removed from every kind and degree of envy toward any creature love u peperuitai not vaunteth not itself which coincides with the very next words but rather as the word likewise properly imports is not rash or hasty in judging it will not hastily condemn any one it does not pass a severe sentence on a slight or sudden view of things it first weighs all the evidence particularly that which is brought in favour of the accused a true lover of his neighbour is not like the generality of men who even in cases of the nicest nature see a little presume a great deal and so jump to the conclusion no he proceeds with wariness and circumspection taking heed to every step willingly subscribing to that rule of the ancient heathen oh where will the modern christian appear i am so far from lightly believing what one man says against another that i will not easily believe what a man says against himself i will always allow him second thoughts and many times counsel too it follows love is not puffed up it does not incline or suffer any man to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but rather to think soberly yea it humbles the soul unto the dust it destroys all high conceits engendering pride and makes us rejoice to be as nothing to be little and vile the lowest of all the servant of all they who are kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love cannot but in honour prefer one another those who having the same love are of one accord to in lowliness of mind each esteem other better than themselves it doth not behave itself unseemly it is not rude or willingly offensive to any it renders to all their due fear to whom fear honour to whom honour courtesy civility humanity to all the world in their several degrees honouring all men a late writer defines good breeding nay the highest degree of it politeness a continual desire to please appearing in all the behaviour but if so there is none so well bred as a christian a lover of all mankind for he cannot but desire to please all men for their good to edification and this desire cannot be hid it will necessarily appear in all his intercourse with men for his love is without dissimulation it will appear in all his actions and conversation yea and will constrain him though without guile to become all things to all men if by any means he may save some and in becoming all things to all men love seeketh not her own in striving to please all men the lover of mankind has no eye at all to his own temporal advantage he covets no man's silver or gold or apparel 
He desires nothing but the salvation of their souls. Yea, in some sense, he may be said not to seek his own spiritual any more than temporal advantage. For while he is on the full stretch to save their souls from death, he, as it were, forgets himself. He does not think of himself so long as that zeal for the glory of God swallows him up. Nay, at some times he may almost seem, through an excess of love, to give up himself, both his soul and his body, while he cries out with Moses, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me out of the book which thou hast written. Exodus thirty-two, thirty-one, thirty-two, Or, with St. Paul, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Romans 9, 3 No marvel that such love is not provoked. U paraxinetai. Let it be observed the word easily, strangely inserted in the translation, is not in the original. St. Paul's words are absolute. Love is not provoked. It is not provoked to unkindness toward any one. Occasions, indeed, will frequently occur, outward provocations of various kinds. But love does not yield to provocation. It triumphs over all. In all trials it looketh into Jesus, and is more than conqueror in his love. It is not improbable that our translators inserted that word, as it were, to excuse the apostle, who, as they supposed, might otherwise appear to be wanting in the very love which he so beautifully describes. They seem to have supposed this from a phrase in the Acts of the Apostles, which is likewise very inaccurately translated. When Paul and Barnabas disagreed concerning John, the translation runs thus, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder. Acts 15.39 this naturally induces the reader to suppose that they were equally sharp therein, that St. Paul, who was undoubtedly right with regard to the point in question, it being quite improper to take John with them again, who had deserted them before, was as much provoked as Barnabas, who gave such a proof of his anger as to leave the work for which he had been set apart by the Holy Ghost. But the original imports no such thing, nor does it affirm that St. Paul was provoked at all. It simply says, E geneto un paroxysismos. And there was a sharpness, a paroxysm of anger, in consequence of which Barnabas left St. Paul, took John, and went his own way. Paul then chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren to the grace of God, which is not said concerning Barnabas. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, as he had proposed, confirming the churches, Acts 15, 39 through 41. But to return, love prevents a thousand provocations which would otherwise arise, because it thinketh no evil. Indeed, the merciful man cannot avoid knowing many things that are evil. He cannot but see them with his own eyes and hear them with his own ears. For love does not put out his eyes, so that it is impossible for him not to see that such things are done. Neither does it take away his understanding any more than his senses, so that he cannot but know that they are evil. For instance, when he sees a man strike his neighbor, or hears him blaspheme God, he cannot either question the thing done, or the word spoken, or doubt of their being evil. Yet, Ulegizdatai takathan the word logistatai thinketh does not refer either to our seeing and hearing or to the first and involuntary acts of our understanding but to our willingly thinking what we need not our inferring evil where it does not appear to our reasoning concerning things which we do not see our supposing what we have neither seen nor heard this is what true love absolutely destroys it tears up root and branch all imagining what we have not known it casts out all jealousies all evil surmisings all readiness to believe evil it is frank open unsuspicious and as it cannot design so neither does it fear evil it rejoiceth not in iniquity 
common as this is, even among those who bear the name of Christ, who scruple not to rejoice over their enemy when he falleth either into affliction or error or sin, indeed, how hardly can they avoid this who are zealously attached to any party? How difficult is it for them not to be pleased with any fault which they discover in those of the opposite party, with any real or supposed blemish? either in their principles or practice what warm defender of any cause is clear of these yea who is so calm as to be altogether free who does not rejoice when his adversary makes a false step which he thinks will advantage his own cause only a man of love he alone weeps over either the sin or folly of his enemy takes no pleasure in hearing or in repeating it but rather desires that it may be forgotten for ever but he rejoiceth in the truth wheresoever it is found in the truth which is after godliness bringing forth its proper fruit holiness of heart and holiness of conversation he rejoices to find that even those who oppose him whether with regard to opinions or some points of practice are nevertheless lovers of god and in other respects unreprovable he is glad to hear good of them and to speak all he can consistently with truth and justice indeed good in general is his glory and joy wherever diffused throughout the race of mankind as a citizen of the world he claims a share in the happiness of all the inhabitants of it because he is a man he is not unconcerned in the welfare of any man but enjoys whatsoever brings glory to god and promotes peace and good will among men this love covereth all things so without all doubt pantostige should be translated for otherwise it would be the very same with pantahupobene endureth all things because the merciful man rejoiceth not in iniquity neither does he willingly make mention of it whatever evil he sees hears or knows he nevertheless conceals so far as he can without making himself partaker of other men's sins wheresoever or with whomsoever he is if he sees anything which he approves not it goes not out of his lips unless to the person concerned if haply he may gain his brother so far is he from making the faults or failures of others the matter of his conversation that of the absent he never does speak at all unless he can speak well a tale-bearer a backbiter a whisperer an evil speaker is to him all one as a murderer he would just as soon cut his neighbor's throat as thus murder his reputation just as soon would he think of diverting himself by setting fire to his neighbor's house as of thus scattering abroad arrows firebrands and death and saying am i not in sport he makes one only exception sometimes he is convinced that it is for the glory of god or which comes to the same the good of his neighbor that an evil should not be covered in this case for the benefit of the innocent he is constrained to declare the guilty but even here one he will not speak at all till love superior love constrains him two he cannot do it from a general confused view of doing good or promoting the glory of god but from a clear sight of some particular end some determinate good which he pursues three still he cannot speak unless he be fully convinced that this very means is necessary to that end that the end cannot be answered at least not so effectively by any other way four he then doeth it with the utmost sorrow and reluctance using it as the last and worst medicine a desperate remedy in a desperate case a kind of poison never to be used but to expel poison consequently five he uses it as sparingly as possible and this he does with fear and trembling lest he should transgress the law of love by speaking too much more than he would have done by not speaking at all love believeth all things it is always willing to think the best to put the most favorable construction on everything it is ever ready to believe whatever may tend to the advantage of any one's character it is easily convinced of what it earnestly desires the innocence or integrity of any man or at least of the sincerity of his repentance if he had once erred from the way it is glad to excuse whatever is amiss 
to condemn the offender as little as possible and to make all the allowance for human weakness which can be done without betraying the truth of god and when it can no longer believe then love hopeth all things is any evil related of any man love hopes that the relation is not true that the thing related was never done is it certain it was but perhaps it was not done with such circumstances as are related so that allowing the fact there is room to hope it was not so ill as it is represented was the action apparently undeniably evil love hopes the intention was not so is it clear the design was evil too yet might it not spring from the settled temper of the heart but from a start of passion or from some vehement temptation which hurried the man beyond himself and even when it cannot be doubted but all the actions designs and tempers are equally evil still love hopes that god will at last make bare his arm and get himself the victory and that there shall be joy in heaven over this one sinner that repented more than over ninety and nine just persons that need no repentance lastly it endureth all things this completes the character of him that is truly merciful he endureth not some not many things only not most but absolutely all things whatever the injustice the malice the cruelty of men can inflict he is able to suffer he calls nothing intolerable he never says of anything this is not to be borne no he can not only do but suffer all things through christ which strengtheneth him and all he suffers does not destroy his love nor impair it in the least it is proof against all it is a flame that burns even in the midst of the great deep many waters cannot quench his love neither can the floods drown it it triumphs over all it never faileth either in time or in eternity in obedience to what heaven decrees knowledge shall fail and prophecy shall cease but lasting charities more ample sway nor bound by time nor subject do decay in happy triumph shall for ever live and endless good diffuse and endless praise receive so shall the merciful obtain mercy not only by the blessing of god upon all their ways by his now repaying the love they bear to their brethren a thousandfold into their own bosom but likewise by an exceeding and eternal weight of glory in the kingdom prepared for them from the beginning of the world for a little while you may say woe is me that i am constrained to dwell with mesek and to have my habitation among the tents of kedar you may pour out your soul and bemoan the loss of true genuine love in the earth lost indeed you may well say but not in the ancient sense see how these christians love one another these christian kingdoms that are tearing out each other's bowels desolating one another with fire and sword these christian armies that are sending each by thousands by ten thousands quick into hell these christian nations that are all on fire with intestine broils party against party faction against faction these christian cities where deceit and fraud oppression and wrong yea robbery and murder go not out of their streets these christian families torn asunder with envy jealousy anger domestic jars without number without end yea what is most dreadful most to be lamented of all these christian churches churches tell it not in gath but alas how can we hide it either from jews turks or pagans that bear the name of christ the prince of peace and wage continual war with each other that convert sinners by burning them alive that are drunk with the blood of the saints does this praise belong only to babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth nay verily but reformed churches so called have fairly learned to tread in her steps protestant churches too know to persecute when they have power in their hands even unto blood and meanwhile how do they also anathematize each other 
devote each other to the nethermost hell. What wrath, what contention, what malice, what bitterness is everywhere found among them, even where they agree in essentials and only differ in opinions or in the circumstantials of religion? Who follows after only the things that make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another? O oh God, how long? Shall thy promise fail? Fear it not, ye little flock. Against hope? Believe in hope. It is your Father's good pleasure yet to renew the face of the earth. Surely all these things shall come to an end, and the inhabitants of the earth shall learn righteousness. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they know war any more. The mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and all the kingdoms of the earth shall become the kingdoms of our God. They shall not, then, hurt or destroy in all his holy mountain, but they shall call their walls salvation and their gates praise. They shall all be without spot or blemish, loving one another, even as Christ hath loved us. Be thou part of the first fruits, if the harvest is not yet. Do thou love thy neighbor as thyself. The Lord God fill thy heart with such a love to every soul, that thou mayest be ready to lay down thy life for his sake. May thy soul continually overflow with love, swallowing up every unkind and unholy temper, till he calleth thee up into the region of love, there to reign with him for ever and ever.